we've almost covered the main techniques to get data across a link, at least data as signals. The data transmission topic, we spoke about the characteristics of signals. Transmission media, we spoke about the, the things between the transmitter and receiver, wired media, wireless media. And then the previous topic, signal encoding techniques, we spoke in a bit more detail about how to convert the data into signals. We're going to cover a few other techniques that we need, especially for digital data. This is a picture from one of our first uh, lectures focusing on link communications. There's a transmitter wants to send data to a receiver across one link. That's what we're dealing with at the moment. We transmit a signal that carries the data. We already know how to convert information into signals. We know the characteristics of signals, bandwidth, frequency. We know about data rate. So we know some things or answers to these questions. We know some different types of transmission media. And we now know how to encode data as signals. We've seen several cases of shift keying, AM, FM, Manchester encoding, and so on. All of these techniques that we've looked at are really dealing with signals. And we group them into dealing with the physical signals. We say they are a part of the physical layer in terms of communications. The techniques we've looked at up until now are about getting signals across the link, the physical signals. But there are a few other things that we need to do to still communicate across the link, which is not so much about signals, but sometimes we need to make sure that when we send data across the link, that the receiver is who we intended it to be. We'd like to know who's at the other end of the link. When you transmit from your phone to the access point up in the corner of this lecture room, think of that as a link, a wireless link. When you transmit that data, you want it to go to that particular access point. If you look around the campus, there are many such access points in different rooms and different floors. So one way to ensure that the data will go to that one access point is when you send it, indicate the address of that access point. So think that every device has an address. And when you send your data, you say the destination of this data is this particular address. So we need to have some form of addressing to know and identify who is at the other end point of the link. Does anyone know the types of addresses we use commonly? Maybe you connect to the SIT wireless LAN. What address does your mobile phone or device get? Anyone seen such addresses? What? 10 point something, point something, point something, an IP address. So you may have seen these 10.10.1.203 type of addresses somewhere show up. That's called an IP address. That's one type of address we use. It's for the internet communications. There are others as well that you probably haven't seen as common, but your device has. I can look at the configuration of my wireless LAN interface on my laptop. So the, the wireless LAN device on my laptop, let's look at some details. It has an internet address, 10.10.100.213. So that's one form of address. And after the midterm, we'll, we'll return to IP addresses, what they mean. It actually has another address, this strange random looking sequence of numbers and letters. This is what we call the hardware address or a MAC address. It's actually in hexadecimal. So there are 12 hexadecimal digits. That is the address given to my Wi-Fi device. And similar, that access point has a similar but different address. Same 12 hex di digits, but different values. So when I want to send data to that access point, I need to know its address. 
And when I send data, I don't just send the data, I send the data plus the address of the access point. So when I send it, if your phone receives it or your tablet receives it, they will know to ignore that data. They'll see the destination address is not me, the destination is someone else, so anyone else who receives that message will ignore it. So we'll use destination addresses to identify who's the intended recipient. That's just an example of a type of address. We will not go too much into the types of addresses in this topic, but we'll see, we'll come back to them, I think, towards the end of the course and look at IP addresses and, and MAC addresses. Another problem with our link. We've seen transmission impairments. Attenuation and noise may result in me sending a sequence of bits, 1100, but because of noise, the receiver receives 1110. We send four bits, we receive four bits, but the receiver gets one of those bits wrong. We say that's a bit error. How do we deal with that? We can't just accept that in most cases. We need to deal with it. How do you suggest we deal with that? If the receiver realises there's an error, what should it do? Any suggestions of how to fix errors? If someone sends you something and you don't understand, what do you do? Ask them to, to say it again or send again. And that's a common technique in data communications. If I send data to a receiver and the receiver detects there are errors, he doesn't understand all of it, one common technique is for the receiver to send back a special message saying, please send me again. I didn't get it correctly the first time. Retransmit, we call that. So we'll spend some time looking at the ways in which retransmissions work. But there are some other ways as well to deal with errors. And there are a few other issues for communicating effectively across a link. The ones which deal with signals we'll call as part of the physical layer. These other issues and the solutions we'll group and call as part of the data link layer. We don't care about the signals, we care about other aspects of the, the getting data across the link. Don't worry too much about why we call them layers at the moment, but just be aware that when we talk about data communications, the different techniques that we use will split into groups. And so far, we'll distinguish between physical layer and data link layer. Everything up until now mainly has been about the physical layer. This topic and beyond, and the next one, are about the data link layer. How to get data across the link. Irrespective of the signaling types. We'll return to those layers and the discussion of layers in a later topic. From now on, let's focus on digital data. Okay, we want to send bits across the link. Even if we have analog data, we know how to convert it to digital data. So if we have analog voice, we can convert it to digital and send the, the bits. So we'll focus on digital data communications. <clears throat> Some things that we have to find solutions for. How to deal with errors. We've mentioned one way to do that. We send some data to the destination. If the destination recognizes that there's an error, it sends back a special message saying, please send again. Okay, so that's one way to deal with errors. Let's consider that scheme. I want to send a 10 gigabyte file from my computer to the destination. I send that 10 gigabyte file. The destination gets it. It took five, five hours to send. Very slow link. Five hours to get there. And then the destination looks and sees of those 10 gigabytes, one bit is wrong. There's one bit in error. So the destination sends back a response to me saying, sorry, though there's an error there, please send again. So I spend another five hours sending that 10 gigabyte file. So this is using this retransmission to deal with errors. 
But what's wrong with that approach? By sending all 10 gigabytes at once, even if there's just one small error, the retransmission requires us to retransmit the entire 10 gigabytes again. So split it into smaller chunks and send one at a time. Okay? So we commonly don't just send the data as is in one big transfer. We split the data into smaller pieces. Instead of 10 gigabytes, maybe we send small chunks of 1,000 bytes each. We send, uh, what, 10 million chunks of 1,000 bytes each. And the receiver realizes of those 10 million that it received, one has an error. So it sends back a message to the source saying, please retransmit that one 1,000 byte chunk again. I only need to send 1,000 bytes the second time, not 10 gigabytes the second time. So that's one reason why we will split data up. There are some other reasons as well. That's common that we will divide data into smaller pieces. We have ways to deal with errors. We'll talk about them. And some other issues maybe at the end of this topic about flow control, how to deal with the fact that some devices may be better than others, faster than others. So the, the techniques that we'll talk about in this and even the next topic are part of what we say is the data link layer. We're not talking about signals anymore. We're talking about protocols to communicate and efficiently deliver data. So we said we need to split data up into smaller pieces. We'll call those pieces frames. So the pr approach for doing that, framing. It's common for communication protocols to split data into smaller pieces and send those pieces one at a time. What is a communications protocol? A communications protocol defines the rules that the transmitter and receiver must follow to communicate. We have a communication protocol that we follow when you introduce yourself to someone. When you introduce yourself to someone, you have a set of rules. Maybe you have a different set of rules whether they are older than you or younger than you. The way that you greet them, say hello, uh, or introduce yourself. There are some rules that we follow. They're not so strict for humans to follow. We're smart enough to be able to uh, adjust and deal with different rules. But the same thing with computers. When two devices want to communicate, they both need to follow the same set of rules Otherwise, they'll get out of sync and we will not be able to communicate. So a protocol defines those rules. And can you tell me the abbreviation of three protocols that you know of? Acronyms? Three protocols. Give me one. Again? I, I mean, UDP? OK. TCP? Anything else? Web browsing uses HTTP. The P in all of those means protocol. Hypertext transfer protocol, the rules for transferring web pages. TCP, the transmission control protocol, the rules for transmitting data across the internet. IP, the internet protocol, the rules for uh, getting data and finding a path through the internet. And there are many other protocols um, which may or may not have P in their name. So through the rest of this course, we'll see more examples of such protocols. Why group into smaller pieces? We saw one example. If you need to retransmit, retransmitting just a small piece is much better than retransmitting everything. There are a few other examples we may see. What are the names of these pieces? Let's call them frames. Sometimes they'll be called other things like packets or messages. We will try to refer to them at this stage as frames. Before the midterm in a couple of weeks, if you look on the website, there's a lesson that's not assessed but talks in more detail about packets. Do that and you'll get a better score in the midterm. 
let's look at what do we mean by a frame. What, what is the format of a frame? Coming back to addresses. I want to send a message to the access point. I said that I should include the destination address. So I don't send just data to the access point. I send a frame that contains the data and the address of who I want it to go to. The destination address, we say. And another thing I'll commonly in include, if I send that frame to the access point, usually the access point wants to respond at some stage. Who does it respond to? Well, in the frame that I send to it, I'll specify the destination address and the source address, my address. So when the access point gets that frame, it knows the frame was intended for it, it is the destination, and it knows if it needs to send a response, it sends it to me, because it, that frame contains my source address. So when we send frames, we don't just send the data, we send some other information as well. Two examples are addresses, source and destination addresses. So, in general, a frame can be divided into three parts. There's the actual data we want to send. We'll commonly call that the payload. That's the thing that we want to get to the, the, the destination. But there's some other information that helps in supporting the operation of the protocol, like the addresses. And that other information is, also, is either included in front of the data, so we call it the header, or it's included behind the data at the end, so we call it the trailer. So in general, a frame may be made up of a header, some real data, the payload, followed by a trailer. Different protocols will define what the structure of the frame is. They don't have to be all the same. In fact, they don't even have to have all three parts. We may have a frame that has header plus payload, no trailer. Or header plus payload plus trailer, that may be the case. Or just header, no payload. That seems strange sometimes. Why would I send something with no data? Come back to our retransmission scheme. Source sends some data to the destination. Destination realizes there's an error. The destination sends back a short message, no data, header only, saying there's an error, please send again. So sometimes we'll send messages which contain no real data, they just contain what we say header. Some information to help the protocol work. It's a little bit abstract at the moment, but we will see many examples of header, payload and trailer through the rest of the course. Why have a header or trailer? We'll treat them as the same. They carry information that's needed to, to communicate effectively between the two endpoints. We can talk about the header having, having a, a set of fields different information split into fields where each field has a value. Let's go to an example and look at a particular uh, frame format and just illustrate some of those fields. What I've done uh, beforehand is I uh, from my laptop, I accessed a website and I recorded the actual frames which were sent and received by my laptop. So I, I can look into them in detail. And I'm just going to show you one particular frame. It was sent from a web server to my laptop. And we'll just use it just to illustrate the example of the frame format. A lot of the details here are not important. We'll just focus on a couple of things. Can we zoom in? No, we're at the maximum zoom. Okay, we zoomed in a bit. 
don't worry too much about the details here. This is uh, some software called Wireshark that shows us a, a particular frame that was, in this case, received by my laptop. And in this case, it was the sixth frame in some sequence. So if we look at the software, there's actually one, two, three, four, five as well, and there's some after six. I've just grabbed one frame. This software tells me that frame is 569 bytes long. The frame has that length, and the frame, in general, is made up of... So the, the frame is 569 bytes long. We can split it into different parts. It can have a header, the actual data, the payload, and then a trailer. In this specific case, the frame has a header, this part. The payload is these four parts, which we'll not look into in depth yet. There's no trailer in this example. It was just header and payload. Let's look at the header. This frame was sent when I had a wired LAN cable plugged into my laptop. So the protocol being used has got the name Ethernet. That's what's the name of when we use wired LAN. So the header, in this case, contains three fields. The header contained the address of the destination device. It was actually coming from the web server to my laptop. So my computer was the destination. My laptop was the destination. Actually, I may have been on my desktop when I'd done this. The source is who sent it. So the address of the sender. And the third field is just some indicator of what's inside this frame. What's the type of data? And in this case, the type of data, it's called IP or the internet protocol. The purpose of showing you this is that to highlight that this frame has a header and payload, and the header has three fields. And the fields are destination, source, and type. The destination is, if you look closely, it's eight by, uh, six bytes long. It's a six-byte address. The source is also six bytes. And if you check the details, you find the type field is two bytes. The header is 14 bytes long. The rest of the information, all of this, is actually the data from this frame's perspective. The, the remaining 555 bytes is, is payload. It's a little bit more complex because the payload is in fact using another protocol which has a header and data. So the payload of our Ethernet frame is an IP frame or packet which has its own header fields. The version, the source address, here we recognize an IP address, the destination address, and some other things like uh, time to live and so on. Not, we'll not worry about the details of the fields to be aware that a frame may have a header with different field values in it. And the fields are defined by the people who create that protocol. And they usually defined in advance <laughs> and fixed. The actual data inside here it was a web page coming from the, the server to my computer. Okay, so that's the actual data inside the HTTP message. This was a wired LAN frame, had three fields. Just briefly, if we look at wireless LAN, Wi-Fi, Here's a wireless LAN frame. It's 425 bytes. If we focus on the header, it has a few more fields. It has the type of frame, some frame control field, which we'll not try to explain. It has some addresses. It has a sequence number. That's another thing that we'll commonly see. If I want to send a thousand frames from my computer to the destination, it's very useful if I indicate which order they go in. 
So I'll attach inside the header a sequence number, like sequence number one, two, three. This is frame with sequence number 115. The next one would be 116 and so on. So that's another field that we may commonly see. Different protocols have different structures of their frames. So we've only covered that in general. Some of the example things that may be included in the header are listed here. Addresses, the length of the frame, sequence numbers, the version of the protocol we're using, and some other things. But these will become clearer when we see some more precise examples, when we look at actual protocols. For the last 20 or so minutes today, I want to talk about some ways in which we measure the performance of protocols or links or networks. How do you measure the performance of your internet access? What would you use? The speed. What? The speed of what? some measure of the, the, the rate at which the data is transferred. What's a practical thing that you may have done? Where do you see that? Bandwidth we will use to return, re refer to signals, but sometimes it's referred in, in other ways. Uh, maybe you download a file. What do you care about? You download a large file from a website, 10 gigabytes. What do you care about in terms of performance? The time it takes to download. Okay? So that's one thing you'd, you'd like to care about, the time it takes to get the entire file. And one measure of that as it's downloading, sometimes you'll see it in your browser, it will show the, the, the speed at which it's downloading, how many bits per second or megabits per second it's downloading at. We'll call that throughput. If we have our 10, megabit, 10 gigabyte file and it takes our five hours to download, then the throughput can be calculated as the, the number of bytes downloaded divided by the time it takes. There's some relationship with data rate, but not, not the same. What's another measure of performance we care about when maybe browsing the internet? Response time. You click on a link to view a web page. From that time when you click on the link until the time when the web page is displayed, We'd like it to be short. Sometimes we call that the response time. The time from when you click on the link, it triggers your computer to send a message to the web server, and then the web server to respond with a web page. How long does it take, we care about. And this is related to delay. How long does it take to get the message from your computer to the server? What's the delay? So some measure in seconds. Throughput and delay, and another measure of delay is, we say, response time, are two things that we care about. But there are some other performance metrics that we care about as well. So let's go through them. That is, different ways to measure the performance of a communication system. We can use them, use them to measure the performance of a real system or predict the performance of a system we may design and build so we know in advance how well it will work. Sometimes we'll talk about different statistics, average, uh, the minimum, maximum, and so on. We've seen metrics already. We've already talked about data rate, bandwidth, SNR. Let's see a few more. In fact, one that we've seen already, data rate we know. We we'll define data rate as the rate at which the da data is delivered from one point to another, across a link usually. And sometimes it's called bit rate. Sometimes we talk about capacity of a link or some other terms. Measured in bits per second. So my LAN card may have a data rate of, say, 100 megabits per second. Usually it's a characteristic of the transmitter and receiver. You buy the device, it has that data rate. It doesn't change. In some cases it may change. 
what's the data rate when I access the wireless LAN access point in the back of the room? How fast can I transfer data to the access point? Anyone want to guess? Let's look at the wireless configuration then, and it may tell me. The data rate is usually the part of the, the spec of the device. And this software just shows me some of the current uh, characteristics of my wireless LAN device. Shows me that it's called bit rate in this software. The data rate is 2 megabits per second. So think of the link, the wireless link between my laptop and the access point. I can send it 2 million bits per second. With Wi-Fi, it actually changes. If you start sending data, depending upon the signal strength, it may uh, change. It's now up to 5.5 megabits per second. I'm sending some data. So it would depend upon different characteristics as what the current data rate is, but it would be from a set of possible values. I think these access points go up to a maximum of 54 megabits per second. That would be the highest I can get. Maybe the signal is not so good, so it's dropped down to 5.5 megabits per second. So that's data rate we've seen before. Normally, it's a characteristic of the link or the devices at the endpoint of that link. What about delay? Quite simply, the time it takes to get some data from one point to another. Some other names, latency. Delay, we normally mean from one point to another, response time or round trip time, one point to another and then back, to get there and back. We measure, it's a measure of time, so seconds. Simple examples first. I send an email at 10 a.m. today. It got to the destination computer at 10.03. The delay of that email was three minutes. It's just the time difference between send and receive. Or I'm starting a timer at time 1.4 seconds. I click on a link on the web browser. And at 2.6 seconds, I see the web page is fully displayed. So here we can say the response time, the time from when I clicked on the link, my computer sent a request to the web browser, to sorry, to the web server. The web server sends a response back. It took 1.2 seconds, as an example. Anyone played games online? What's an important performance metric with playing online games? Ping, ping time. Okay, the ping. Well, ping actually is an application for testing the performance. Ping is, a, ping is an application. You can run it on your computer, you can run it on Windows. If you open a, a, a command prompt, you can run ping. And what it does is it sends a test message to some destination. That destination sends back a response, and Ping reports the response time, or it calls the round trip time. For example, I want to ping the ICT web server. Ping is a program that will trigger my computer to send a message to the ICT web server. Let's hope it works. Sometimes SIT blocks ping. But we'll see. Yes, it's working. I'll do it again, and you'll see what's happening. What's happening every one second, my computer sends a special message to the ICT web server. When that web server gets it, or that computer gets it, it sends back a response. And whenever I get a response, this program prints a line on the screen. And the last column shows me the time from when I sent the request until I got the response. The ping time, or more precisely, the round trip time. 
So it just keeps going, this software. Every one second sends a message, gets a message back. The protocol being used is called ICMP. This is an abbreviation here. That's not important. Just note that the time's in the order of, what, 20 to 50 milliseconds. About. It varies. I send a message. I got a response back in 39.8 milliseconds. Then I sent a message again. I got a response back in 13.1 milliseconds. And then 49.5 milliseconds. First thing to notice, the order is about tens of milliseconds. ICT server is on the third floor of this building. So the message is going up to the access point in the corner, following some wires and down to the third floor. It's taking tens of milliseconds. It's going via multiple other devices. The other thing to notice is that the delay varies significantly in some places. It goes up to 105 milliseconds. So it's not fixed. Even if it's going along the same path, we get a different delay. So in the next lecture, we'll come back to delay and talk about why do we get a particular delay? Why, why is it 27 milliseconds? Why is it 105 milliseconds? So we'll return to, to delay in the next lecture. And then Ping shows us the average delay, 41 milliseconds on average. We've got two or three more metrics to finish. Not so hard. Error rate. What fraction of our data arrives in error? Or doesn't get delivered to the destination? For example, I send an email to 100 students, to the entire class. Five students don't receive the email. Something went wrong. So we can say the error rate is 0.05, 5 out of 100, or 5%. So error rate, there are no units, it's a ratio. Ratio between the errors to the total number. Or, I send 1,000 bits across a link, and I measure for every 1,000 bits length, uh, sent, 23 bits arrive at the destination, but they are wrong. For example, they were sent as a zero, but the destination thinks they are a one. So 23 of every 1,000 bits is in error. So we can say there's a bit error rate of 23 out of 1,000, 0.023, or 2.3% of the bits received are in error. So this is another metric that we'll see in some uh, communication systems. What is the bit error rate, or what is the frame error rate? What fraction of messages uh, do we have problems with? Of course, we'd like it to be low. Sometimes, we'll, if we know what it is, we can measure other performance metrics. Overhead. We said with our frames, we send payload, the actual data, but we may also have a header and trailer some other stuff. We refer to that other stuff as overhead with respect to our payload. The amount of additional data needed to successfully deliver the real data. That's overhead. The last one's a simple example. I send a frame, here I wrote a packet, but I send a frame that contains a thousand bytes of data, a thousand bytes of payload. That's the real thing I want to deliver. But the protocol forces me to attach a 25-byte header at the front and a 25-byte trailer at the end. The total overhead is 50 bytes. So we'd like to keep the overhead small, but we need some overhead in some cases to, to support the protocol operation. So that's just a measure, measure of how many extra bits or bytes do we need to send to get the data there. Throughput, you download a file. I download a tw 12 megabyte file. It takes me 16 seconds 
If you see a 2 here, then you're reading it wrong. This is 16, not 26. Change that. Okay, so it takes 16 seconds. Why 16? Because I made a... It, if it takes 16 seconds, what's the throughput? Well, 12 megabytes every 16 seconds. 12 megabytes divided by 16 seconds turns out to be 6 megabits per second. So I just had a typo there. It should be 16. I'll show you why. We have 12 million bytes. Let's convert to bits. 96 million bits were transferred. How long did it take? If it takes 16 seconds, so we divide by the time, 6 million bits per second. So we say the throughput in that case is 6 megabits per second. Now this may not be the same as data rate. The time it takes me to download that file may depend upon the data rate, but it may depend upon other factors as well. This is the throughput is the measure, the rate at which we deliver the real data to the destination. One last example, the one at the bottom. My Wi-Fi link has a data rate of 54 megabits, megabits per second. I send frames. Every frame contains 500 bytes of data or payload and 200 bytes of overhead, maybe header. Let's write that down. This will be an example to finish today. We have my mobile phone and the access point. a wireless link and the data rate of that wireless link is 54 megabits per second. Everything we send will send at that rate. And a frame has 500 bytes of data or payload plus 200 bytes of header or overhead. Total frame size is 700 bytes. How long does it take to transmit that frame? Well, we need to send 700 bytes and we send at a rate of 54 million bits per second if we know the amount and if we know the rate at which we send, we can work out how much time it takes. 700 bytes at 54 million bits per second gives us the amount of time it takes. We can calculate. The time to transmit that, 700 bytes divided by 54 million bits per second gives us some time in seconds. I'll convert to bits times by 8. 5,600 bits are sent at the speed of 54 million bits per second. That's the number of seconds it takes to transmit. Same as if you have to drive uh, 700 kilometers and the speed you drive at is 100 kilometers per hour, then it takes you seven hours to get there. The distance divided by the rate. Here we have the size divided by the rate. That's the number of seconds. It's about 104 microseconds, 103.7 microseconds. So to transmit my frame, it takes 104 microseconds. 
But the question says, or the, the example says that we transmit a frame and then we spend 20 microseconds not sending anything. It's like we have a pause, do nothing, and then send the next frame. That's a common characteristic of wireless protocols. So visually, we can think we transmit a frame. It's going to take 104 microseconds. Then we spend 20 microseconds doing nothing. If we think of the transmitter, then we transmit another frame. Same size, takes 104 microseconds. And then the rule of the protocol, do nothing for 20 microseconds. And keep doing that. and so on. So the question is, what is the throughput? What is the rate at which we receive real data? Well, how long, what's the time frame we're dealing with? If, from the receiver's perspective, every 124 microseconds, it receives one frame. In the next 124 microseconds, it receives one frame. And then in the next 124, it receives one frame. So we can say we're receiving one frame per one, two, four microseconds. The 104 for the transmission time and the 20 for the waiting. But how much real data do we receive? One frame contains 500 bytes of real data, of payload. The 200 bytes left over are overhead. Throughput counts the payload only. So we can say we receive 500 bytes of payload per 124 microseconds. Therefore, the throughput, we receive 500 bytes every 124 microseconds. Five hundred times eight convert to bits. Let's use the same. And divided by 124 <laughs> microseconds, sorry. If we divide by micro, the answer will be in mega. Micro is 10 to the power of minus 6. If you divide by 10 to the power of minus 6, the answer is 10 to the power of 6, the multiplier, mega. So the answer is 32.3 megabits per second. My Wi-Fi link allowed me to send at 54 megabits per second, but only some of what I send is real data, only 500 out of the 700 bytes. And sometimes I don't send anything. The, the rules were I, for 20 microseconds I couldn't send. If we look in total, we see that on average I can send 32.3 million bits per second of real data. That's my throughput. Every second I could send 32.3 million bits of payload. So that's the measure of the actual user throughput. How efficient are we in using the link? My link has a data rate of 54 megabits per second, but I'm only using it to achieve 32.3 megabits per second of throughput. 
So you think I buy a link for this speed, but I only use this amount, so we can say that's a measure of efficiency, how efficient we are in using it. If you do the calculation, it's about 0 0.6. About 60% efficient. That's the final performance metric that we wanted to introduce. You buy a link for 54 megabits per second, or that's the, the maximum speed. You only use 32.3 out of that 54. We can say we're about 60% efficient in using that link for actual payload transfer.